So I'm going to just set some a kind of introductory to this whole uh, conference by just giving some background on what I personally see with my co-author, Werner Zittel of Germany, some of the limits to global energy supply. I'll run through it. The planet has immense energy resources, but we can use mu and we can use much less energy for the same outputs, for the same key outputs that we want. We want heating and cooling, we want to travel certain distances, we want to make things, we can use much less. So we have a lot of energy and we can use much less. But the purpose of this talk is to say that we're at a very interesting time. We face some really tough limits on a number of things. And I've picked out seven, which I'll go over very briefly. On conventional fossil fuels, you can make the case that we're at a global maximum in the production of conventional oil at current prices. We're probably about now. You'll hear other views later, but this is our view about now, the global maximum of conventional fuel or conventional oil for a number of reasons. We've heard about shale gas, very interesting, but for conventional gas, we see the limits, the maximum again, driven by a variety of constraints as not far away. And this is not often realized. This is still conventional. We're talking conventional in both cases. We may interestingly be close to some sort of maximum for coal, amazingly, conventional coal, so it doesn't count uh, in situ combustion or other non-conventional approaches, but coal as well. Conventional oil, conventional gas, conventional coal. Then we move to some of the alternatives, more limits that we're facing. Most of these alternatives, as Ewan Mearns referred to in his opening speech, his excellent opening speech, have, low, have difficulties, in this case, lower energy returns for the fuel. So instead of going in the past from a good energy to a better energy in many ways, in some cases now we're facing this interesting situation of going from a good energy to a less good energy in some ways. Really quite interesting. And then there's some quite sneaky little rate limits that are creeping up on us that limit the rate of change. So we want a future, we want those sunny uplands, but there are some rate limits that will stop us getting there as quickly as we want. Two other limits we all know about. High energy cost destroys our economies, and we have the greenhouse gas emissions that we've talked about and we'll talk some more. What bothers me is that we've known many of these limits for a long, long time, but they've gotten forgotten, many of them. Most, in my opinion at least, are not in current models, and there will be an energy modelling workshop at the end of this conference. Everybody's welcome to attend on, on, for putting these limits in. And so I maintain, and I think it's right, we don't really understand the energy future we face. And that's really quite a serious situation. General remarks. There's a lot of topics here. I've put in far too much in the slides. Those who don't like slides which get skipped over are going to be very disappointed. There's some slides I'm going to have to flash up and take them away. But there's a lot of, and there's backup information. There's going to be some backup slides as well. For instance, when the first slide said there's immense energy resources, a wonderful non-scientific term, in the backup slides you get it in zettajoules. You'll know how much there is in zettajoules, and we all use half a zettajoule a year for tradable primary energy. So you'll see the figures in zettajoules, and the slides anyway, both these slides and the backup, will be on the website. Let's look at limit one, and I spent a lot of time in this short talk on limit one because it is the oil, it has kind of a parallel to the gas and the coal, so if we understand this, then we can understand the others. To understand the limit of conventional oil, you need to know a number of things, and here they are. Never use proved reserves, still many, many sources use proved reserves, don't touch them at all. You've got to use the industry database, and we have with us a representative, I'm pleased to say, of the industry, one of the industry databases. You've got to use these 2P, proved and probables. You've got to understand this thing called midpoint peaking. I'll come to it later. Must be understood, absolutely critical. You've got to understand the difference between a capacity forecast and a likely forecast. We all, they are very different animals. 
And then you need to understand why we haven't heard all this before. Why have those mainstream forecasts from the big organisations all been so wrong for so long? So let's start with oil price. I've got 15 minutes left, not much. Here's a picture courtesy of Ewan Mearns, who drew it up originally. You've got in the bars, you've got production going all the way from 65, global oil production up. Here's the 73 oil shock. I lived through happily. Here's the 78 oil shock up and up and up. And here we are, some sort of shaky growth at the moment. In red, quite separately on this scale, is price. And we see in real terms, these are real terms, inflation adjusted, price here spiked in 73 and then 78, down and down and down and back up and here we are again. So in terms of kind of the area of this that hurts us, here we are, quite a solid period of high prices that's hurting us. So we go through those seven things you need to know about conventional oil, why we think we're close to the maximum. Why are we close to the maximum? What's driving it? I say never use proved reserves. Here we are, they have some problems. They're understated, overstated, and in many cases not stated. Don't touch them, disaster. You've got to have the 2P data. And then interestingly, if you compare the 1P data on reserves with 2P data on reserves, I'll do that right now, sorry to rush ahead, a nice complicated graph from a very competent man, Jean La Herrera. Let's look at it briefly. This is over time, gigabarrels of remaining reserves, of global remaining reserves of oil, all the way back from 1920, those at the back, up to here, up to now. If you take the database of the 2P reserves, they went up, they peaked about 1980, and they've been coming down. If you take the 1P reserves, this line here, they tell a very different story ever upwards. Many, many people will say, we keep finding more oil. Here it is, an a wonderful story of ever more reserves. Like all of science, you've got to separate things out. These graphs contain different things. These contain some non-conventional. This doesn't, non-conventional oil. But more importantly, here's a nice graph showing the OPEC proved reserves. Okay, this is the non-conventional coming in for Venezuela, but here's a big step. And then here's the non-OPEC, and there's the Canadian reserves coming in. So a very different story if you look at the industry data set looking, than looking at the proved reserves. Very different story. Sorry to rush ahead, folks. I do apologise, but it's all on the web, will be on the web. Now, the next thing that really needs to be understood is midpoint peaking. And the critical thing is if you have this much oil, you know about it, you're sure about it, you've got this much oil, and you think, boy, I only need some of it. The trouble is if you've got this much oil that you know about, you can only produce some of it before you get to a maximum and you start getting less and less. And the reason is quite complicated. I'll drive you through it, but it hasn't been recognised or hasn't been recognised in many senior groups, amazingly. And what drives it? So most analysts didn't know you need to know, have to need the data. They were happy to work with 1P, big mistake. Most did not have access to the 2P anyway, because it's either very expensive or it takes a huge amount of manpower to generate. And I have to say, most didn't, if they'd had the data, wouldn't have known about the midpoint peaking or wouldn't have fully understood it. Midpoint peaking is a shorthand. It's only a rule of thumb, but it, draw, it combines a lot of complicated things. Crucially, it combines the geology, the distribution of field size. A lot of oils in big fields, littles in small. It combines the physics, as Professor Alaclet will keep telling you quite correctly, pressure decline and on water cut in fields. So you've got physics and you've got economics. And there was a very good paper out of Uppsala looking at the whole midpoint peaking in terms of the economic side of the story, very important. And it comes down to marginal versus average cost. But those complicated interplay together, geology, physics, and economics, and you understand midpoint peaking. It's a rule of thumb. Can't take the time to go through this, but here's a nice illustration of that with the geology and the physics. Doesn't have the economics in this, so you need a little more to see that, but there's a nice simple model to explain midpoint peaking. Now, how do we know that we're somewhere near, somewhere near a maximum of oil production? And here is a nice complicated graph. Let's look at it. This is cumulative discovery and cumulative production all the way since 1900, quite a long time ago, and it looks out to 
2075. So it's nearly two centuries. So it's quite an important data set. It is from the two, it is of the 2P, it's a combination of data sources, it's not written there for some reason, the combination of data sources is by this man, Jean La Herrera, and it's 2P data. So let's look at oil, I've got four graphs here, this is oil discovery, this is oil production, we'll look at the gas in a minute, here is oil discovery, and here is some of the Texas, here is Gawa being found in the Middle East, up and up and up, and you can see the sort of inflection that we've been finding, still finding oil, still lots of oil to find. Don't let people tell you there isn't. There's lots of good oil to find. But we've slowed in our finding, and La Jerez analysis is probably, at least in the medium term, not maybe the long term, she slopes over. And now let's look at global production. So that was discovery, cumulative. And here is production going up and up, this one here, so you can see that as of today, this is 2011, as of today, roughly, you have used about a bit more than half of what you've discovered, half of what you've discovered. And that comes back to that midpoint rule of thumb I told you earlier. This is global, doesn't apply exactly. There's all sorts of caveats which you've got to understand and look at, but it's a nice rule of thumb. Since you're here and you've discovered this, you expect to have, you expect to have oil supply difficulties. And we've known this for a long, long time. And of course, you can go back to this sort of date and do those predictions then. You can go back 20 or 30 years and say, I expect global supply difficulties of conventional oil about this sort of date. And we've known it a long, long time. So that kind of confirms. It's not the detail. You'll hear a very nice paper on the detail two after mine. But that's, that's the general story to say why we should be concerned. There is a big difference between capacity forecasts and likely forecasts, and we do want to go through that. I have 10 minutes. Capacity protections look at what is possible, how many fields are out there, what sort of fields, who's producing. You do have to overlay that with some economics and what projects, projects are coming along. But you make some assumptions. You look at all the fields you think they might come on, you look at technology growth, you look at, you rule out political events, it's all okay, they're good assumptions, and of course you look at all liquids because your fuel tank doesn't care whether it's conventional or non-conventional or biofuel. Energy return cares, but not your fuel tank. And so you can get a, a report from this authority, you can get this man, Miller, who does a conventional all fallow. It's quite a complicated graph, this story of this. Now you can turn it around to likely, and then you be more careful, even those models do it, but you have to be more careful about what your production profiles you assume from the different types of oil. You want some caution on your Middle East reserves. That caution may not be well placed, but you want to have some caution on your Middle East reserves. You certainly want a lot of caution on the fields that haven't been produced for many years. Will they come on? Some have been sitting there, some haven't. Richard Miller thinks there might be as much as 108 billion barrels, gigabarrels, in doubt in the fallow fields. And you have to look at what's happening to multinationals who don't have access to some of these areas, and they're in decline. So here's some of the other models. So you have to differentiate capacity from likely. Not saying either is right, but you need to understand the difference. So let's have a look at some of the outputs, dates of plans. So I've looked at midpoint peaking to give you a feel that we've mankind has known for a long time that our discovery of conventional oil has been slowing. So we've known for a long time we ought to wake up. But now let's look at some specific ones. Here's a, a, a paper you'll hear shortly. That'll have an undulating plateau starting in a while. Take a study by Miller who used to work for BP. If you take all the conventional oil and you put in all the fallows, you can get your peak quite late. But if you start moving down to some of the other, other studies and you look at all oil and so on, you get a peak at about 2030. And if you look at Colin Campbell, well known to many of us, who takes a more conservative view, he's the only man who was right on the price, more conservative view, he in La Herrera, then you have the peak about now. So you have this range of things to understand. We need to understand it, but there's every reason to be cautious on conventional oil conventional oil. Here, I just for an illustration, I put in plenty of other graphs, but I don't have enough time. Here for, it's just one of the graphs to show you the sort of things that are being talked about. This is 
production of oil and gas. This is date 1930 to 2050, again over a century. Up goes oil, conventional oil. Here's some of the non-conventionals coming in, giving a sort of plateau, okay, out for a while and dying away. Here's conventional gas and here's all the shale gas and other sorts coming in, tight gas and who knows in time, hydrates, methane hydrates, who knows what will come forward. But it's a worrying, if you're a global planner and you're worrying on one hand about climate change, on the other hand about oil supply, you've got to have this in your thinking. Last piece of the puzzle, I told you the sort of five bits, and that's why haven't we been hearing this from the mainstream? And the mainstream means the IEA and EIA and OPEC and so on. And the fundamental reason for a long time was field decline, wasn't put into the models. And if you don't put in individual field decline into the models, you happily project past, discover, past production and you project it up and project it up. So this is year by year by year by year by year. IEA forecasts the production going down, and now the bottom one is not a, is not a forecast only based on trying to meet 450 ppm. So if we want to meet 450 ppm, as, as Lord Oxborough has shown earlier, you've got to do something pretty quick. So it a run, folks, so much. No time for that. There is a lot of other oil, we know that, and it's quite important. So the question is, how will the conventional oil production peak play out against these other oils? All, I can't go through this slide. All we can say is this is the end. For all sorts of technical reasons, mankind is at a new and interesting limit. Conventional oil, we're at the end of cheap oil as we've known for many years. We can argue what will go forward and there's some interesting stuff to hear, but that's, and I warn everybody, in the short term, prices can fall. You mustn't confuse cost and difficulty with price. You've only got to have a slight imbalance and prices can fall for a while, but it doesn't negate the fundamental constraints that we're all hitting. I had seven limits, so I've got four minutes to do six limits. Gas, conventional gas, the same plot you've seen, just read it the same way we went through for oil. Now this is the gas discovery, here's these wonderful finds in, in the Far East, in the Far East, Middle East. That's this gas discovery, that's gas production, cumulative to date, world. So you can see we're not anywhere near the half point way point, we're moving towards it. We will get there probably in another 10 years or so. So you probably shouldn't expect a problem on global conventional gas for 10 years, probably. Here's Cole, this is Werner Zittel's study. He warns, cautions, global coal data are too poor, surprisingly, to do other than educated guess. And he comes down on the rather conservative side. But goodness me, that's rather an alarming story. This is 1960, 2100, global production of hard coal, not lignite, hard coal. Up she goes and down, with this being the bulk of China, and I'm very much looking forward to the, the talk that's going to come after this on China coal. That was gas. We've had conventional gas. We've had conventional oil first, conventional gas. Here's then conventional coal, hard coal. Now we have this very interesting thing that Ewan Mears referred to in his talk, not exclusively, but in many ways, we're moving from good energies to less good energies, certainly in terms of energy return on energy invested. This is a new paradigm and an interesting place to go. It's not a, necessarily a bad place to go, but an interesting place to go. And these are the sort of numbers you need. Here's oil in 1930, 1970 today. These estimates are very difficult to do. They're open to lots of questions, but falling energy returns. So the amount of energy you put in to get the thing out, and we talked about it with CCS. You have to worry about all these things. Down here, some numbers. And when you go down, we all know, when you look at the biodiesel and the gasohole and so on, some have gone numbers negative, some have got one, but low numbers, whatever it is. Limit five, rate limits. This is something I've been pushing for a long, long time. If you try and move quickly from A to B, I've got two minutes, A to B, you want to go there. If you're on a little sailing boat and you're, you're heeling over too much, you've got to put your boat upwind to, 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 to reduce the pressure and you don't, so you don't go over and sink. But then you do the turn, the momentum of the turn makes you keel, heel over more. So in trying to correct the situation, you might sink. You've got to be careful. So here's your energy return. 
There's lots of limits, but the one about, oh, pardon me, the one about putting the energy in to make a thing expand quickly, I'm really keen on photovoltaics. I love photovoltaics. To me, they're nearly the magic bullet on energy. But so far, we've put in 100 gigawatts, a staggering number. 100 gigawatts of PV have been put in, and it's given mankind no net energy back. PV has not yet given us any energy back. It will in time, but so far, we've been putting energy in from our fossil fuels to make our PV grow. If you want to model rapid changes of society from A to B, you have to do these sorts of things. Limit six, high energy costs destroys economies. This is a plot, this is OPEC production. This is taking away its own consumption. So OPEC's consumption is of course going up. So there's a bigger gap between what they produce and what they need. And this is not the, this is the cost to the economies of those who buy it. And here we go. OPEC oil costs those who buy it a trillion dollars a year. It cost that much back in 78. We're back up to a trillion a year, real terms prices, to buy the oil from OPEC 14. Greenhouse gas limits, we've talked about that very competently and we'll talk some more. We've known about all these a long time. Look at the slides to see how long we've known about them. I gave 1896 for Helios, but I now realize I should have given Tyndall slightly earlier. Conclusions. The planet has immense energy resources. You can see them in zettajoules. We can do with an awful lot less. I won't go through all the technologies, but some amazing technologies and society changes. But we face peak conventional oil, soonish, peak conventional gas, maybe problems on conventional coal, hard coal, lower energy returns on many of these, not all. Worry about the rate of change from going to the society we have to those bright sunny uplands that we all want. High energy costs destroy your economies, tough to get the investment, tough to convince them to put the money into CCS because they're all worried about economies. We all want growth, greenhouse gases. So all I want to say, thank you very kindly.